With their cold blood, bony scales, beady eyes, and with their powerful jaws fitted with sharp teeth, crocodiles and alligators sure look beautiful and nightmarish. But are they really the stuff of nightmares? Well, yes, especially if you get too close and personal. Welcome to Fierce's Reptile Marathon, a compendium of the most gruesome stories of crocodile and alligator attacks. Remember, if you find yourself in a swamp, just get out. It was May 2016, and 47-year-old Leanne Mitchell was finally cancer-free and ready to put that horrible chapter of her life to rest. There was only one person Leanne had wanted to see once she had finished her cancer treatment, Cindy Waldron, her best friend since forever. They'd met in high school, and nothing had come between them ever since. They had always remained close, despite the physical distance between them, with Cindy living in Lithgow, New South Wales, and Leanne living in Trinity Beach, Cairns. Over the years, Cindy and Leanne had been together through it all, happiness and sadness alike. And when Leanne was diagnosed with breast cancer, nothing could get Cindy to leave her friend's side. Once Leanne Mitchell found out her cancer was in remission, she decided it was time for a celebration. And naturally, Cindy Waldron was the person she wanted to celebrate with the most. The two friends chose the Daintree Rainforest as a destination for their vacation. Located on the northeast coast of Queensland, Australia, the Daintree Rainforest consists of 460 square miles of green, luxuriant rainforest. The Daintree is also part of the oldest surviving tropical rainforest in the whole world. In fact, the Daintree is over 135 million years old. As you can imagine, there's nothing quite like it. There are some plant and animal species unique to the area. Together, the rainforest, the white sandy beaches, and the reefs in the area make for a diverse habitat. The area is popular with tourists not only for its natural beauties, but also because it offers a variety of activities. There are cruises down the Daintree River, guided hikes on exotic trails, but the area is also remote enough, perfect for quiet, relaxing celebrations and vacations. 47-year-old Leanne Mitchell and her lifelong close friend, 46-year-old Cindy Waldron, got together on May 29, 2016, and drove north to the Daintree Rainforest. Both women were excited about their vacation, and more than grateful that Leanne had beaten cancer. They couldn't imagine life without each other. In fact, they used to talk about becoming little old ladies together all the time. Cindy and Leanne thought they would always, always be together, laughing and sharing their lives as best friends. But our plans aren't guarantees. They're merely human desires to be decided by forces greater than us. Fate, some would say, or in Cindy and Leanne's case, nature. Once the two women arrived at their destination in the Daintree Rainforest, they checked into their room and started celebrating. They were happy, unaware that things would soon take a horrible turn. Cindy and Leanne decided to go for a walk. They were at Thornton Beach, one of the Daintree's many white-sanded beaches. During daylight, Thornton Beach is a perfect spot to watch the waves and marvel at Struck Island, a patch of land just off the beach. But by the time the two women started their walk, it was already really dark. Their path was illuminated by the stars and the moon and little else. Still, the night seemed perfect. Once they hit the sand, Cindy Waldron and Leanne Mitchell started running and laughing, frolicking on the beach like they were once again little girls who shared everything. Their friendship was undying. At some point, the two women ended up on the water's edge. Cindy Waldron's back was to the vast expanse of water, while Leanne Mitchell's back was to the beach. The women were laughing, but then, in a matter of seconds, everything changed. 46-year-old Cindy Waldron cried out to her best friend, Leanne Mitchell. At first, Leanne was amused. She thought she heard her friend yelling, It got me. Leanne immediately assumed Cindy was being melodramatic and humorous, and that her friend's reaction was caused by a piece of seaweed brushing her leg but then it quickly became painfully obvious that Cindy was truly frightened, and for good reason. 
Something big and strong pulled the women into the water and dragged them out from the shore. Now terrified, Leanne extended her arms and started searching the water with her hands. The dark made it impossible for the two women to see anything. Then Leanne's heart started beating furiously, overcome by fear. She touched something, something cold and terrifying, something that felt an awful lot like the head of a crocodile. Gripped by panic, but also intent on saving herself and Cindy, Leanne Mitchell started punching the crocodile in the head. She punched it and hit it. She screamed at the top of her lungs and then punched the creature again. Nothing worked. The creature pulled them into the water once more. It was crazy strong. Leanne Mitchell clawed at Cindy Waldron's arm, trying to grab her friend and get both of them back to safety. But soon enough, there was nothing for her to grab. It was like her friend vanished. Cindy Waldron was gone. Leanne dived down, but she couldn't see anything. It was just too dark. The woman knew that she had to help Cindy somehow. She knew she had to get help, but all she could do was scream Cindy's name over and over again. Eventually, Leanne Mitchell made it to shore and alerted local authorities. She was taken to the hospital where she was treated for her injuries and for shock. Meanwhile, the search for Cindy Waldron started as soon as the local authorities were alerted, but everybody knew Cindy Waldron's chances of survival were low. For the next five days, police and SES volunteers set crocodile traps and combed the land and water around the area, but to no avail. On the fifth day of the search, the 3rd of June, rangers managed to capture a 14-foot estuarine crocodile. The animal's size and its location strongly indicated that it was the one that attacked Cindy Waldron and Leanne Mitchell. Police confirmed that human remains were found inside the animal. Estrin crocodiles are among the most well-known animals living in the Daintree. They can do a lot of damage, and they're a real threat to unaware visitors. There are signs all over the Daintree warning people about the dangers of swimming in the croc's natural habitat. After the crocodile was captured, Cindy Waldron's father and sister made a visit to Thornton Beach to say their goodbyes and be close to where Cindy spent her final day. Mr. Waldron said Cindy would sometimes do crazy things on impulse. What she did there was a crazy thing, absolutely crazy, but that was her, he said. Anna Lee Annette, Cindy's sister, described the death as the most heartbreaking, horrendous thing to ever happen to her family. She also stated that the family thought the crocodile was not to blame. After all, the Daintree was its habitat, its hunting ground. Various reactions emerged after the attack. Some people called the attack completely avoidable and a result of human stupidity. But Cindy Waldron's friends and family were left mourning. Cindy was described as an outstanding woman and friend who had the biggest smile. Leanne Mitchell publicly spoke about the attack two years after it happened. She told reporters, We would always, always be together, and now we're not. It was a Saturday on June 7, 2014, when Bill Scott and his wife Roslyn headed out to Darwin, Australia, and made their way to Bill Dean Billabong. The Billabong, which is located on the South Alligator River system inside Kakadu National Park, was one of Bill's favorite places in the entire world. The man was nothing if not an enthusiastic fisherman. He'd been going to the Billabong for the past 20 years, often joined by his family. In fact, Bill would camp there two or three times a year, taking every opportunity to spend some quality time in that special place. The man loved anything that had to do with the outdoors and the landscape of the Northern Territory. He loved buying maps and planning trips to remote locations. He had decades of experience as a bushman, a fisherman, and a boater. That was his lifestyle, and he was well aware of both the dangers and the beauties of nature. Once Bill and Rosalind arrived at the Billabong, they were greeted by their son Aaron and his wife Joanne. Like his father, Aaron was also deeply devoted to the outdoors. He'd been going on trips into the wild ever since he was a kid, always an enthusiastic presence at his father's side. 
Both Bill and Aaron had their boats, and they were eager to get out on the water and start fishing amidst the beauty of Kakadu National Park. Kakadu National Park is a world heritage site with diverse landscape, flora, and fauna. Many plant and animal species in the park are rare, endangered, vulnerable, or endemic, perfectly adapted to their habitat. But there are some species that thrive inside the park, so much so that they are now considered a problem. It is the case of crocodiles, which have, over time, taken over the park's waterways. Crocodile hunting has been banned since 1972. Ever since, their number has skyrocketed, and some experts consider there to be an overpopulation. In fact, some even speculate crocodiles inside the Kakadu National Park are now as large and as numerous as before European settlement. Bill Scott knew there were crocodiles in the park. He never took unnecessary risks. Once he and his wife Rosalind arrived at the Bill Dean Billabong, they met up with Aaron, their son, and Joanne, their daughter-in-law. They had breakfast together, catching up. Then, at about 10 a.m., they put their boats in the water, ready to head out on the billabong and start fishing. The family was cautious enough to look for crocodiles, but there were none in the water. Still, they knew to be careful near the edges of the water. Their small boats were perfect for navigating on the billabong. They moved upstream for about three miles. Then Bill and his family started fishing. They weren't in a hurry. It was a Saturday morning, and they planned to camp in the park until Monday. The family spent the next four hours fishing and chatting, happy to take in the sun and be with each other. At about 2 p.m., they decided it was time to head back to the camp. Bill and his son moored their boats. Then Aaron and his wife Joanne left to go up the bank to fetch the 60-liter tank the family usually took camping. They needed to fill it and then let it sit in the sun, a simple procedure that would guarantee warm water for washing in the evening. Aaron entered the water up to his knees. He knew there were crocodiles, and he didn't want to risk his life. He was in and out in seconds, only filling half of the tank. The rest would have to be filled by the whole family, but in a seemingly safer manner. Aaron then carried the tank to a flat spot on the bank. Meanwhile, Bill was still in their own boat. He was at the back of his small boat. He took a bucket, leaned over the boat's edge, filled the bucket with water, and then passed the vessel to his wife, Rosalind, who was standing on the bank. Rosalind took the bucket and then handed it to Joanne further up the bank. Joanne finally handed it to Aaron, who poured the water inside the tank. It was teamwork. Everyone chipped in. After the second bucket, the tank was nearly full, and the family discussed whether a third bucket was needed or not. Rosalind decided to hand one of the buckets back to Bill and have him fill it, but the man never got the chance. Suddenly, the boat began to rock. At the same time, Rosalind noted a small ripple in the water. The harsh movement knocked Bill Scott off balance. Struggling to steady himself, 62-year-old Bill Scott put his hands out towards the back of the boat, and that's when it happened. A massive crocodile shot out of the water from behind the motor with an unexpected speed. The animal closed its huge jaws around Bill's left arm, shoulder, and chest. It was over in seconds. In an instant, the huge creature snatched Bill Scott from the boat and dragged him deep beneath the water's surface. Rosalind and Joanne watched in horror. Aaron, who had his back turned, thought he heard his father say something. But once he turned around toward his father, he only saw a splash. All of them started crying in terror. Aaron raced to the boat and started circling the area, hoping his father would somehow manage to free himself from the croc's mouth and swim back to the surface. In reality, there was nothing they could do to help the man. He was nowhere to be seen. The family started screaming louder. Bill, if you could hear us, make a noise and we'll come find you, they called out but there was no answer. Aaron then jumped into his boat, reversed it some 50 feet, stopped, and looked around. Nothing. Then he spotted a ripple about 165 feet downstream. He chased it, but once again saw nothing. Aaron then hurried to a nearby resort to raise the alarm, leaving Rosalind and Joanne at the billabong. The women kept watch, and then, 
they saw Bill's body floating to the surface, face down in the water. Roslyn tried to start the boat, but couldn't get it to start. Instead, she rowed it into the billabong, intent on retrieving her husband's body. But by the time Rosalind made it out, Bill's body had disappeared again, dragged beneath the surface by the powerful animal. Once Aaron returned with help, they resumed their search, but all efforts had to be ceased once it got dark. The search recommenced the following morning. Just before noon, water cop Wade Rogers shot a crocodile fitting the description of the one that took Bill. The crocodile measured 15 feet. It was indeed a huge creature. An autopsy was conducted at the location. As soon as rangers opened up the body, they were met with a gruesome sight. Bill Scott's remains were found inside the crocodile's stomach. Bill Scott's tragic fate sparked an inquest indicating that crocodiles have become familiar with humans and boats and generally have not developed the fear of humans that once existed when humans were also predators. This means crocodiles in the area are no longer afraid to snatch humans out of their boats. Of the 21 people killed by crocs in the Northern Territory since 1974, four died in 2014 the largest annual toll since records began. Twenty-eight-year-old twin sisters Melissa and Georgia Laurie were on the trip of a lifetime. They were traveling around the world, a backpacking adventure that would test them to their limits and beyond. Three months into their journey, they traveled through Mexico. They spent some of their time volunteering in an animal sanctuary, as well as visiting some of the incredible sites that Mexico has to offer. Traveling together meant that they always had each other's back, and that's exactly what happened on the afternoon of June 6, 2021. Traveling on a budget often means you get to see more of the country. You get to experience the place more like a local. There are no fancy hotels, private car hire, or luxury day trips. For 90 pence, Melissa and Georgia jumped into a van that would take them 10 miles away from the popular resort of Puerto Escondido to Mani Altepec Lagoon. They climbed out of the van at a restaurant called El Guayacan, sitting on the edge of the lagoon. It was a beautiful, still body of water surrounded by lush vegetation and sandy beaches. This was the starting point for their organized tour, a tour that was found out later to be illegal and hosted by an illegal tour guide. They boarded a small riverboat and motored upriver amongst the mangroves away from the lagoon, away from the approved swimming spot. But the girls were oblivious to this. They had paid for their tour and they joined a group of other tourists also keen to see the sights. As the guide moored up the boat and cut the engine, the two girls followed the rest of the group and their guide into the water. They hadn't been drinking. They weren't being foolish. They were enjoying the refreshing coolness of the lagoon and swam out into the middle of the water, away from the bank, away from the rest of the group. What they didn't know was that this body of water was also home to crocodiles. It was a nesting ground for the huge reptiles. They used the mangroves for cover. They hunted for fish, birds, and small mammals in and around the water. Beneath the surface, they lurked. The splashing of the tourists caught their attention. And after the group had been swimming for a little while, Melissa spotted something in the water, a sight that froze the blood in her veins. Her adrenaline started pumping. Her heart was thundering in her chest as she saw the head of a crocodile pop up in the water a short distance away. It began to move. It was coming towards her. Silently, its tail powered it through the water, its eyes and nostrils above the surface. She yelled out to the others in the group, warning them that there was a crocodile, and everyone began swimming as fast as they could back to dry land. But Melissa didn't make it. The crocodile opened its jaws wide and brought them crushing down around Melissa's body. She was dragged underwater. One second she was there, the next she was gone. Melissa screamed as she was taken under. Thoughts of her family flashed through her mind. The thought of never seeing them again. The agonizing thought of her twin having to repatriate her body back to the UK. Of her parents having to bury their daughter. She thought she was going to die. She could feel the searing pain of the crocodile's bite. The force from its powerful jaws as it held her underwater. Georgia swam desperately towards her sister with no regard for her own safety. 
Melissa reappeared above the surface momentarily before being dragged back below. From the intensity of the attack, Melissa lost consciousness and the crocodile thrashed her around in the water. Her body was being thrown from side to side like a rag doll. Then it performed a death roll. Holding Melissa in its jaws, it rolled over and over in an attempt to drown its prey, disorientating it and knocking the air from its lungs. Frantically, Georgia smacked the crocodile on the face. Its hard armored skin felt like solid wood as Georgia punched it again and again, her knuckles pummeling it on the head and snout over and over. It worked. The crocodile let go of Melissa just long enough for Georgia to grab her. She pulled her towards the bank by her hair, trying to swim to safety, trying to make it out of the water. But the crocodile came back for more. It was determined to get its meal. It knew its prey was injured. It could taste the fresh blood, the scent of a meal. Georgia watched in horror as she and her sister were pursued by the crocodile, only its head above the water as it came in for another attack. She whacked it again and screamed. The commotion in the water, the screams, and the frantic paddling of Georgia were seen by other tourists. They scrambled to get out of the water, horrified as the attack unfolded. As Georgia fought off the seven-foot croc, it lunged at her. It grabbed her arm in its jaws, pulling at her, but she refused to give up. With her sister unresponsive next to her, she used her other hand to punch the crocodile on the nose. Stunned by the reaction, the crocodile released its grip. A tourist boat dashed to the girl's rescue. The crew hauled the twins aboard and assessed their injuries. Georgia had deep lacerations on her arm and hand and cuts to her legs. But Melissa was far worse. She was coughing up blood. Her body was covered in puncture wounds, but luckily she wasn't bleeding profusely. Drifting in and out of consciousness, Melissa felt the sensation of drowning from the blood building in her lungs. She had also breathed in a significant amount of water. Each time she came to, she screamed out and gasped for air. The pair was rushed to the hospital, Georgia holding her sister's hands and singing Stand By Me and Three Little Birds over and over again, her voice soothing, calming her sister down and keeping her focused on anything but the pain. It was all she could do. She couldn't let her sister go. They were soulmates, a special bond between twins. When the girls arrived at the hospital, they were both pumped full of antibiotics to stave off infection from both the water and the crocodile's mouth. For Melissa, it was touch and go. Doctors placed her in a medically induced coma, giving her the best chance of fighting off the infection. She had made it this far. Now she needed to hold on a little longer to allow her body to recover from her horrific ordeal. Following the attack, their river guide, thought to be a German national and unlicensed and unregistered within the tourist trade, fled. He hasn't been seen since. The twins' parents flew out to Mexico to be with their daughters. Five days after the attack, Melissa was woken from her coma. Her breathing tubes were removed and she was able to breathe on her own. Six months on from the attack, the two girls said that they still had nightmares about it and suffer from PTSD. They were lucky to make it out alive. Georgia did the right thing. She never gave up on her sister. She never stopped fighting for her. It could have all ended very differently, but they were there for each other. It was a terrifying animal attack. How many people can say that they survived a crocodile's death roll? Lauren Fila was a 25-year-old woman who lived in Morristown, New Jersey. She was full of life, someone who would light up the room when she walked in, someone who volunteered her time to those in need, a strong and much-loved member of the local community, a Christian who volunteered with the youth ministry. But Lauren had had it tough over the past few years. You would never tell from her strong exterior and unfaltering smile, but she and her family had suffered a terrible loss. In 2006, her sister had a rock climbing accident in which she fell to her death. And although the family still mourned that loss, they somehow got through it. Now, four years later, tragedy was about to strike again. In April 2010, Lauren was traveling through India. She had decided to take one last adventure before settling down into a new career. Her whole life, she had enjoyed art. She graduated from Vanderbilt University having studied art. 
She often produced bright, vivid, surrealist oil paintings, but also fine, detailed charcoal sketches. Following her passion and flair, she completed a master's in which she gained a distinction from Sotheby's Institute of Art in London. Now, a year later, she decided to switch paths and embark on a career in social care. She had benefited from it enormously during her own grief at losing her sister, and now she wanted to give back. She was passionate about helping people and was always at the other end of the phone for those in need. Lauren had met a 24-year-old man by the name of Hito Chada through a mutual friend. He had been born in Morristown, and the pair hit it off. Hito's father had grown up in India, and that's where the couple decided to journey to that April. Visiting India was the final adventure Lauren was looking for. Situated in the Bay of Bengal are the beautiful Andaman Islands. They are picture perfect. Flowery white sand, turquoise blue waters, and a backdrop of lush greenery. The islands offer tourists a mix of relaxation and adventure. Lauren and Hito stayed in the wooden lodges at Barefoot Resort on Havelock Island. These rooms with thatch roofs are surrounded by jungle, with walkways which lead down to the white sandy beach. A short distance away is Neal's Cove, an idyllic spot for snorkeling in the clear waters. The cove was situated just off Radhanagar Beach, a place deemed safe by locals and where locals had never even seen a crocodile. In fact, the habitat was not considered suitable for saltwater crocodiles. There were no mangroves to provide cover, and the shallows led out to a reef and the open sea beyond. But what follows suggests otherwise. Hito was an experienced scuba diver and surfer. He was at home in the sea. The pair decided to go for a spot of snorkeling and headed for Neil's Cove. As the pair entered the water, they had no idea that there was an enormous reptile out on the hunt in the open sea. The water was calm, visibility was good. They swam out to the reef, spotting brightly colored fish and coral, pointing sea anemones and starfish out to each other. The water was warm, the sun beat down, but then suddenly a 12-foot crocodile came out of nowhere. The couple hadn't spotted it powering through the water towards them. They had been too distracted by the beautiful underwater scene below them. Its tail swished from side to side, its legs tucked into its body, a streamlined predator coursing through the water with ease. It had sensed the two swimmers in the water from a short distance away, and now it homed in on them. Suddenly, Lauren was struck by the animal. It immediately grabbed her legs and held her in its jaws, knocking the air from her lungs as it dragged her underwater. Hito saw the whole attack play out. He was just feet from Lauren. He had been filming underwater with his camera when the crocodile came in for the kill. Instantly, he let go of the camera and swam over to Lauren. If he could have jumped in front of the crocodile, then he would have, but it all happened so fast, it was an ambush attack. Out of respect for Lauren's parents, he has never disclosed the struggle that ensued. He has never described the horror that he witnessed but he was incredibly brave swimming towards the crocodile. He tried to rescue Lauren. He tried to fight the animal off, but it was too powerful. It was too strong. He had no weapon. He had no way of pulling the animal off her. He claims it was pure instinct that took over. He didn't hesitate for one second. Lauren needed his help, and he was there, trying desperately to pull her free from the jaws. He tried to get himself between Lauren and the croc, but it was no use. The crocodile had Lauren securely and wasn't letting go. Then the crocodile swam off with her. There was nothing Hito could do. Seeing his friend taken away in such terrible circumstances is something that will replay in his mind forever. Not being able to save her is something that will live with him for the rest of his life. He swam as fast as he could back to shore and ran for help, but it was too late. When authorities arrived, there was no sign of Lauren. They regarded Hito's story suspiciously. He had last been seen walking to a secluded cove with a young woman, and now she had gone missing. Alarm bells began ringing in the police officials' ears. They didn't buy his story either. There had never been a crocodile seen in that cove. Not ever. It wasn't the right habitat for them. They wouldn't venture that far from the seclusion of vegetation. The distraught Hito tried to explain what happened, but his words fell on deaf ears. A search was launched for Lauren, but as the hours passed, 
Keto's story seemed less and less likely. It would be two days before Lauren's body was recovered. Miraculously, Keto's camera was also recovered from the seafloor. It was to provide a crucial piece of evidence. Until then, officials suspected he was responsible for Lauren's disappearance, and things could have gone horribly wrong for him. However, when officials played the recording back, the attack and Hito's heroic effort in trying to fight off the 12-foot giant could just about be seen. The camera caught a glimpse of the attack as it sank downwards in the water column, capturing the scene near the surface. Lauren's family was of course devastated to hear the news. She was due home shortly after that snorkeling trip. She was due to attend a concert set up for a church youth project, but instead of it being devoted to the youth, it was now performed in Lauren's memory. Her cousin was absolutely appalled that there were no signs warning tourists of crocodiles. She said that Lauren would never have entered the water if she had known of the potential dangers. The family found out after the tragedy that a crocodile sanctuary, Lohabarak Crocodile Sanctuary, was just 45 miles from the island. In the past, there have been reports of some crocodiles escaping. The local government came under criticism. It needs to decide to either keep the area as a crocodile sanctuary or as a safe location for tourists to visit. Swimming and snorkeling do not go side by side with crocodile sanctuaries. Henry Kutze was a big name in the adventure community. He was born in 1975 in South Africa, and in 2010, at 35 years old, Kutze had already garnered quite the reputation for himself. Kutze first gained recognition back in 2004 when he led a Nile River source to sea expedition. This first noteworthy expedition was inspired by John Goddard, the first person to navigate the entire length of the Nile River in a kayak. Kutze's first expedition took four months, but it was a controversial one. Several claims that the expedition had not begun from the true source of the Nile determined Kotze to prove his critics wrong. In April 2005, he commenced a second leg of the expedition, a further journey from Kagera to Lake Victoria. With over 4,600 miles completed, Kotze's first expedition was finally over and a resounding success. It was December 7, 2010, and Henry Kutze was leading a groundbreaking whitewater kayaking expedition from the headwaters of the White Nile and Congo Rivers into the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He was joined by 32-year-old Ben Stooksbury and 24-year-old Chris Korbulik, two world-class kayakers with extensive experience. Stooksbury and Korbulik were also dedicated explorers. With primary sponsorship from Eddie Bauer Incorporated's first ascent line of outdoor gear, the three men had started their trip a few weeks before. Their purpose was clear, document the white water of the White Nile and Congo and development projects in the region, bring attention to the horrible clean water crisis affecting millions in the region, and of course, be the first to boat the white water of the Lakuga River. Henry Kotze had a bit of an agenda himself. He wanted to show Stooksbury and Korbulik the beauties of the region. He wanted to take them from the snow-capped peaks into the deepest, darkest, steamiest jungle. And he wanted to show them Western media had it all wrong. This wasn't one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Instead, it was a place of immense beauty, with nice, hospitable people and breathtaking nature. The Lakuga is a tributary of the Lualaba River in the Democratic Republic of Congo a largely unexplored river, teeming with wildlife. Hippos and crocodiles are a normal sight on the river, and Kotze was very well aware of this. He had made sure to warn Stooksbury and Korbulik about the possible dangers of the expedition. Kotze, who was familiar with the region, had instructed them to steer clear from eddies if they didn't want to encounter dangerous hippos wallowing underwater. Banks were also to be avoided because crocs would often sunbathe on them. Moreover, he taught his team to tap their boats to make noise. As a further precaution, the men decided to always paddle close together, in a formation that made them appear as a large animal to any potential predators. December 7, 2010 started out with a bit of an adventure on the Lakuga River. The three adventurers had just finished what was generally considered the unnavigable portion of the river. Nobody had ever made it across the portion in no sort of boat. Nobody except them. 
they had paddled more than 30 miles of whitewater. By then, Stukesbury and Korbulik were confident in their skills and more than used to their surroundings. The three little crocodiles they had seen on the water that day, all of them just three feet long, didn't scare the men. They were in formation, safe and victorious. After navigating the last stretch of the rapids, Kutze, Stukesbury, and Korbulik faced 100 miles of flat water, a nice calm change of pace. They were in the middle of a stretch about 100 feet wide, paddling full pace in tight formation. There was thick elephant grass along the side, and the scenery was astounding. Kutze was in the middle of the formation, with Stukesbury a little in front to his left, and Korbulik a little behind to his right. Every now and then, when they got out of sync, their paddle blades would touch. At one point, as they paddled, Korbulik glanced over to make sure they weren't paddling away or towards each other. That's when he saw it. It all happened in an instant. A huge crocodile, a terrifying creature, shot out of the water, opened its massive jaws, and clamped down on Henry Kotze's left shoulder. The animal's jaws were as big as the man's entire torso. There wasn't enough time to act. There wasn't enough time to do anything at all. Kotze himself could do little else than shout, Oh my God, before the animal pulled him under the water. His kayak was almost completely submerged. The overturned boat shook for about 20 seconds as the crocodile pulled Kotze from the cockpit. Just like that, in the blink of an eye, Andre Kotze was gone, never to be seen again. Several dread-filled minutes passed. Stukesbury and Korbulik watched in silence, who stunned to move. Then the two men snapped out of their daze. They figured the animal could come back, and they knew there was nothing they could do to protect themselves if they just waited around. They had to get out of the river and fast. The two men paddled about a mile downstream to a nearby village. As they were talking to the locals, trying their best to explain what happened, they saw Henry's boat floating downstream. Stukesbury and Korbulik went after the kayak, just in case, but there was no sign to be found about Hendry's struggle. Once they returned to the village, the two men tried to convince the villagers to help them look for Hendry, but the villagers refused. They knew better. Hendry Kotze was truly gone, and he wasn't the only one. This particular crocodile, a 15-foot, two-ton beast, had already claimed the lives of nine people. Ben Stukesbury and Chris Korbulik were devastated. They'd spent seven weeks with Kotze, and they both agreed this had been the strongest team they've ever been a part of. The men were evacuated by the International Rescue Committee, and now they had to make their peace. It was certainly one of the most terrifying, hurtful experiences of their lives, but at the same time, the expedition had been enlightening. Ben Stukesbury later recounted, The unfortunate thing is the night before this happened was one of the most beautiful nights of my life. It had rained and we were all pretty happy to get cooled off by the rain. We all huddled up under the tarp on a beach and were all smiles and super happy with each other. We were overwhelmed by the place. To say that croc came out of the blue is both literal and figurative. He took us at our happiest. The village where the two men stopped after the incident put out a small reward for any news or clues regarding Henry Kotze, but nothing was ever found, not even a small piece of clothing. A memorial service for Kotze was held on 28 January 2011. The only things he had were books. He didn't even own a bicycle. He never left anything behind. Wherever he went, he just sewed a bit of who he was. He was always so humble and never spoke about his expeditions or accolades or achievements. He was just Hendrik. He was such a special son and I had such a special relationship with him. He was just awesome said Marie Neiman, Hendry's mother. Hendry Kutze is still remembered as one of the greatest river explorers in recent history.